Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Neil Seidman, and I'm the co-chair of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And we're really happy to present uh, this webinar. It's entitled, Talk Saves Lives, an Introduction to Suicide Prevention. And our presenter is Dr. Jill Harkavy Friedman. Now, before we start, I wanted to say a little bit about ADAA, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. ADAA was started back in 1979, and today it's the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. And our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, like our webinar, practice, and research. And we work to see if we can end stigma and to get the word out that these conditions are real, they're serious, and they're treatable. And I want to invite everybody to visit the ADAA website. It's really a wonderful resource. So that's adaa.org. And also, by the way, you can support ADAA by making a charitable donation on the website. OK, so let's get started. I'm really happy to introduce our presenter, Dr. Harkavy Friedman has been a pioneer in suicide research and suicide prevention for over 30 years. She has worked with people dealing with suicidal thoughts and behaviors since 1984, which is when she developed and directed uh, the Adolescent Depression and Suicide Program at Montefiore Medical Center. That's at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York City. And she continued her work in suicide prevention at Columbia University from 89 to 2011, which is when she took up her current position. And Dr. Harkavy is currently the Vice President for Research for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. The foundation started in 1987. It has local chapters in all 50 states and programs and events all over the country. Dr. Harkavy leads the uh, association's, uh, uh, she leads the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Research Grant Program, and she works with national research organizations to develop and implement research efforts towards suicide prevention. She's published over 100 peer-reviewed articles, and she also maintains a clinical private practice that she's had since 1986. So uh, now let me turn it over to Dr. Harkavy, and she'll take it from here. And really appreciate her being our presenter for today. So thank you so much, Dr. Seidman, and also many thanks to ADAA for uh, hosting this webinar to bring the issue of suicide prevention to the forefront. Um, if you I, want to click on uh, show my screen. It's not turned over yet. I think you have to change uh, no. it. Change it over. Yeah. So if you click on Show My Screen, no, a little drop-down arrow. I think you have to do the Change Presenter first. Uh, I did. I thought I did. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Well, you know. How's that? <laughs> it's hard to turn out. Oh, here we pass go. Here change. we go. Here we go. <laughs> okay. My, my mistake. No problem. Okay. We should be. Everyone should be able to see my screen at this point. Looks so. great. Looks great. Thank you. Okay. 
So um, welcome all. So glad that you're coming to this webinar to learn about suicide prevention, something that pe for some time people didn't realize you actually could prevent suicide, but now we know better. Um, okay, I'm trying to get my next slide. Okay, the first, the first point that's so critical to this understanding of suicide prevention is that suicide is a complex health issue. And it's a complex health issue that you can help prevent. And there are some essential ingredients that we want you to think about. So think about when somebody ha has a heart attack. They don't just out of the blue have a heart attack. There are often some warning signs and risk factors. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't realize it till hindsight. So the purpose of this webinar is to help us bring to the forefront some of the background that may contribute to suicidal behavior. So one of the factors, just like in other health conditions, that's so critical to saving lives is time that if you can get some time in there, then you can identify the problem and take action. And with regard to suicide, it's about connecting. Connecting person to help, connecting with a person, and helping them to take action to save their life. So in, today, we're gonna cover a lot of information. We're gonna talk about, excuse me, we're gonna talk about the statistics, the research in this area, and we're, that relates to suicide prevention, and we're going to talk about what you can do to help prevent suicide. So let's talk about the statistics for a minute. And in terms of statistics, uh, this is a worldwide problem, and the World Health Organization has been attempting to figure out the scope of this problem for many years. And they have estimated conservatively that 800,000 people die by suicide in the world each year. And they say this is a conservative estimate because many countries don't e even count, let alone report, their suicide statistics. So it's probably in the neighborhood of a million, maybe even more. Probably, yes. It's such a huge number, my goodness. And we're talking about people who actually die by suicide. Yes, it's a huge number of people. Uh, it's so many that if you if suicides happen continuously over time it would be about one suicide every 40 seconds if you think about it if you were to set your egg timer for a minute somebody would have died in that time point in the united states it's the tenth leading cause of death and at the we just got in hot off the presses the numbers for 2014 15 so you'll see on this slide the number for 2014 was 42,773 people that we know of died by suicide in the United States. In 2015, the number has actually, unfortunately, increased to 44,193. This is more than if you combined homicides, war, and natural disasters in the year 2015. So we're talking about a, a health problem that has tremendous scope. For every suicide, the estimations are that 25 people will actually make a suicide attempt. And of course, those numbers vary by age, with younger people make more younger people per death and fewer older people per death. So in the elderly population, it's estimated that one in four people who makes a suicide attempt will actually die by it. But the other part is that most people don't die by suicide, and that's the balance we have to keep here. If we add it up, though, we're talking about a million suicide attempts a year, approximately. That's a lot of people suffering and struggling. It's also estimated that each, that most Americans will actually experience suicide of someone they love or care about in their lifetime, and that each wow. time. Yeah. If I can interrupt just for a moment, I mean, what, what this slide brings home is that if uh, a member of our audience that's watching this now has been touched by suicide, this is a very common experience. Right, and, and that's, that's a really important point for such a very rare event to actually happen and affect so many people is unusual. And um, 
if you are affected by a suicide loss and you're grieving a loss, we you can always find some help at AFSP.org, that's for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, backslash suicide, surviving suicide loss. Um, and we have lots of resources for people who've lost somebody to suicide. So I think one thing, it's, as Dr. Seidman said, it's important to realize that you're not alone if you're experiencing a loss. And a long time ago, nobody talked about it, and people felt they were alone. And that brings even more pain onto the problem of losing someone by suicide. But fortunately, times have changed, and um, there is support and help for, for everyone. The other thing is that in addition to the toll on families and communities, both emotionally and socially, there's actually a physical, fiscal impact that suicide has. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it's estimated that in 2015, suicide cost about $51 billion in the United States. That's just in one year. And those costs relate to medical costs as well as uh, costs due to loss of wages and productivity. So the first thing we're going to talk about, if you remember back to the order of this, is that we're going to talk about some research. In the past few decades, uh, we've l actually learned something about suicide, and that's helping us to identify people at risk and also provide interventions. And I know it was mentioned that I've been in this field since 1984, and when I first got in this field, you weren't even supposed to publicly use the word suicide. So when I started the Adolescent Depression and Suicide Program, people were like, you can't put suicide in the title. And I said, well, how will they know where to go if they don't know that we help people who are suicidal? Um, things have changed a lot since then. And this has become, uh, the, there's much more spoken out about suicide, and that's how we can make a big difference. So Does that actually help prevention to actually talk about suicide and use that word, it doesn't promote people thinking, oh, I'm going to, now that I heard the word, I'm going to be more likely to attempt suicide? You know, that's a really good question. And it depends on who the, the person you're talking about. So if you're talking about suicide with a friend or you're talking about it in a way that promotes health care and self-care, then you can make a difference and save a life. Now, when the media talks about it and they repeatedly present about it, they use the word suicide in the headline with methods, that's another story. That can create something we call contagion. But if somebody is struggling and you say, some, ask them if they're thinking of suicide, not only will you not hurt them, but you have the potential for helping them because that's often a relief. So opening that door for conversation, which is why we call this Talk Saves Lives, is critical so that people don't have to hide when they're feeling. It's hard enough to be feeling these things, but then feel that you're alone and no place to turn makes it harder. The other thing is you can't make somebody suicidal by saying it or asking them about it because that's something that comes from their own uh, makeup and their experience. And we're going to talk more about that because it's a complex process. But in most cases, talking about it with a friend or a family member is going to be helpful, not hurting them. Absolutely. That's, okay. that's what this whole uh, presentation is about, about talking about it, reaching out to people and connecting. Even if they don't announce that they're suicidal, you might be worried about somebody. And that's something to take seriously. So the first question that the research always tries to answer is, why do people take their lives? Um, and that's a question, of course, that people who've lost someone to suicide also wonder. And it's really important. You know, we're, we tend to want to think of one cause. Oh, it was this or it was that that caused it. But there is no one single cause of suicide. It's many factors that come together. And often there are stressors, health issues, and those things come together with the experience of hopelessness and despair. So one of the things we do know is that 9 out of 10 people who die by suicide have a mental health condition that's contributing to their death. That doesn't mean they know they have it. It doesn't mean that they've sought help for it and been appropriately diagnosed and received treatment. But when we go back and we look 
back at the person's life, we know that they have been experiencing a mental health condition. We also know, however, that most people with mental health conditions don't die by suicide. And in fact, one in four people will suffer from a mental health condition at some point in their life. And most don't go on to die by suicide. So we know that while it's related to suicidal behavior, it's not the cause. We also know that there are physical differences between suicide, the brains of people who die by suicide, and those who don't. And those differences are both in the structure of the brain for instance, how many receptors there are and how, many, how close they are together, and also how the brain functions. So we know that when people are at risk for suicide, in those moments, their brain function becomes less flexible. And they have, people who die by suicide have different stress responses, both in terms of being sensitive to stress, as well as being able to respond appropriately to stress. Also, the brain tells us when to do something and when to stop, when to not act on impulsive behavior. And that control is affected in the brains of people who die by suicide. It's not necessarily permanent, but that's the, that without attending to it, there are these differences. And the other thing that's really important to remember is most people who attempt suicide are ambivalent about it. They have reasons for wanting to die and they have reasons for wanting to stay alive. And a key strategy in suicide prevention involves engaging the part of the person that wants to stay alive. And we help them to create distance from the part of them that wants to die. And one way we do that is to connect with the person and their reasons for living. We want to increase the visibility. That doesn't mean the person who's suicidal in that moment is going to say, oh, yes, you know, you might say, don't forget, you love your kids, your kids love you. In that suicidal moment, they're having trouble connecting with that. They might actually believe their kids would be better off without them. And that's where the connecting and, and, and reshaping the way they're thinking about it to help them realize that they feel that way now, but their kids won't be better off without them. And we're going to talk so like what you're, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what, you're, what you just said is like you're acknowledging what they're feeling at that moment. Absolutely. You, want, you acknowledge it because there's no right or wrong in feelings. That's what they're feeling. And arguing with them about what they're feeling or telling them they're wrong isn't going to make them feel better. It's probably going to make them feel more alienated and like nobody understands. So just even reflecting back to somebody, oh, you feel like your life isn't worth living. I understand that. Can we talk about that some more? You know, maybe there are alternate views. Opens that conversation. Um, because they're, again, they're having, we're going to talk more about this, but they're going to have this kind of tunnel vision that this makes sense to them. And they've, te you know, they're in tremendous pain, and it makes sense to them that the world will be better off without them. But it actually doesn't make sense. And remember, most people who make suicide attempts go on to live healthy lives with much happiness and quality. So, um, but at that moment, and that's why time is so important. The person who's suicidal is thinking, this is it. I can't take any more. I am in unbearable pain that I have no way out of. And then their thinking becomes limited. and. If you think about when you had the most pain in your life, um, whether it's breaking a bone or childbirth or having a kidney stone or whatever it is, think about that most painful time. And in that moment, if somebody came up and asked you for directions to their house or your house, would you be able to give them those directions? Unlikely, because you would be in such unbearable pain that thinking clearly is nearly impossible. And that's what happens for the person who's in a suicidal crisis. So that's a really good analogy, like being in, in intense physical pain. And what effect is that going to have on my ability to think clearly? Yes, exactly. I mean, just think about everybody gets a cold. When you have a cold, how well do you start answering questions, thinking on your feet, engaging in conversations? Probably not that well, because you're kind of fogged up. Now, being in a suicidal state isn't 
like having a cold, but the point is they don't have access to their usual coping strategies and they don't have access to their usual flexibility of thinking. So the other important point is that this is a temporary state. Even for the person who's thinking about it more often, um, the time in which they might actually act on it is often temporary. And if you can get people and help them through those um, difficult times and help create a safe environment, you could save a life. Okay, so there are several goals I want to mention. You know, research is a process and in terms of research in suicide prevention, we're relatively early in the process, but we are getting to the point where we're identifying some markers of suicide risk and developing some psychotherapies and other interventions, even on a, a community level, um, like educating people about suicide risk factors and warning signs, as well as medications that might help when someone is at risk for suicide. And in terms of treatments, often psychotherapy accompanied by medication is the most effective treatment. And this is where research is going to try and figure out how can we identify people at risk and how can we help them so that they don't go on and take their lives. Research has also helped us to figure out who's at risk for suicide. And as I mentioned before, suicide is a complex dynamic of many things that come together at a particular point in time. So if you go back and you think about a person who's at risk for a heart attack, right? They might have high blood pressure, they might have a history of heart disease or a family history of heart disease. And so it's the same for suicide. There are health risk factors, historical risk factors, and environmental risk factors. So in terms of health, it could be your biological health, your psychological health, in terms of historical factors, it could be things that happened to you or your family history. And environmental could be cultural, social, access to lethal means, and specific events that happen in a person's life. And so we, it, it's challenging, but we need to remember that it's all these things together that come together at a particular point in time to create risk. So. Let's look a little bit closer. So let's start off with health factors. Well, as, as I said before, uh, basically 90% of people who die by suicide have an active mental health condition at the time of their death, and often more than one. So depression is the most common, and it's the most commonly identified mental health condition, but there are other mental health conditions that are also critical to think about. Bipolar disorder, for instance, especially in the depressed state or when somebody is in an irritable state. Anxiety disorders that accompany depression or bipolar disorder. Personality disorders like borderline personality and psychosis when people are uh, not able to stay in reality or they're hearing voices or seeing things, smelling things. And substance use disorders are another important risk factor for suicide. So knowing that somebody has a mental health condition is critically important because that means that they can get help, that they can seek an evaluation and effective treatment. And so if you feel concerned about someone or about yourself, a full evaluation can reduce, reduce the risk of suicide. The other thing is taking care of your mental health helps you feel better overall in terms of your well-being and your life functioning. And if you're not feeling well mentally, it's probably affecting your social life, your work life, and your health. So taking care of your mental health condition is critically important. Other health factors that we've learned about are serious or chronic health conditions. Not because having that condition in and of itself makes you at risk, but it might also uh, be a catalyst for a mental health condition that you might not otherwise have gotten. Serious or chronic pain and serious head injuries can all contribute to whether or not a person is at risk for suicide. So we have both the mental health on the one hand and then physical health on the other hand, they're both important. 
and they affect each other, you know. When you're feeling well physically, you feel better mentally. When you're feeling well mentally, you're feeling better physically. So um, they go hand in hand. We don't make that distinction anymore. It's all part of health. Uh, so we have to take care of our bodies and our minds. Um, in terms of historical factors, one is a family history of suicide and a family history of mental health conditions. Often there isn't suicide in the family history because the family member got help and so they weren't, they got effective treatment so that they weren't engaging in suicidal behavior. Another factor is child abuse or ch early life trauma. And um, previous suicide attempts is often a, a uh, it's a, often a risk factor in that when you know that somebody's made one attempt, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to go on and make more. But you want to take note that that is in their background because past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. And about 40% of people who die by suicide have made a previous attempt. So that's an important thing that that uh, is e might be easy to find out if if the individual is willing to share that with you. If someone has had a suicide attempt in the past, that's a red flag that that person could be at risk. Right, exactly. So, it, and if there's no, if someone wants to share that with you, if you ask them and they share it with you, that's information that helps you and that they can talk about. If they don't want to share it with you, they won't talk about it anyway. But you're being open to asking about these things will help a person who's worried because if a person's made an attempt they may be worried that they're going to make another attempt and just having the opportunity to talk about it makes a difference. Um, another area where there are risk factors are environmental factors and again you'll notice there are many factors in each list and, and a person could have more than one. So first is exposure or contagion, and that's where, the, for example, the media or if there's a local suicide, how that's dealt with can make an impact. It's not going to make somebody who wasn't at risk suddenly suicidal. The person who's at risk with the, in terms of exposure is the person who really already has other risk factors and is coming close to a crisis moment themselves. And then say they see a news story about a celebrity that committed suicide, Robin okay. Williams, or mm -hmm. that could have a negative effect. That could, you know, it, you bring up Robin Williams, but depending on how it's depicted, it absolutely can have a negative effect. Um, if they just keep talking about how they did it and with graphic detail, that is not, is, can be potentially harmful and is certainly not helpful. If they talk about what you can do if you're feeling uh, depressed or you're having problems with substances and your life feels like a mess, then that could be really helpful. So it's all about how the media portrays it. Um, in addition, prolonged stress can uh, create a, in, a, not just a social environment of being on edge, but also a biological environment. You probably might have heard about Cortisol and cortisol is a hormone in your body that also relates to depression. So prolonged stress affects you physically and mentally. In addition, stressful life events can trigger uh, suicide in a person who's at risk already. So um, prolonged stress would include things like being harassed, being bullied, relationship problems, legal problems, and unemployment. And stressful life events could be a divorce or a job loss, uh, things that happen um, in your life. And then finally, access to lethal means is really critical. People don't realize that you could save a life just by removing access to lethal means from the environment when you're worried about someone at risk. And, you know, there are a variety of lethal means, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. So. Oops, sorry. Here's an example of a set of risk factors that come together. What happened here? I'm having a little trouble. Wait, let me. Yeah. There we go. Okay. You may see somebody who just broke up and they have a broken heart and they engage in suicidal behavior, right? And so you think, 
well, if they broke up or they were bullied or they lost a job and that was it and then they just killed themselves because of that event. And I want you to think about one thing. That's not the full story because plenty of people break up with people, plenty of people lose jobs, unfortunately plenty of people are also bullied and they don't take their own life. So what we often don't know until we go back and look at the picture is you may find somebody who was suffering from some depression and anxiety and their work life had become increasingly stressful and the depression and anxiety made a you know, made the work more stressful and the stress may, at work may have made them more depressed and anxious. So maybe they started drinking more than they normally do. And the next thing you know, you have a person with some risk factors who's depressed, not functioning well at work and drinking. And then an event happens and they're no longer equipped to cope with something that they normally would be able to cope with. This is really important because intervention can happen much earlier when we know something about the risk factors and warning signs. And also, if we see that something is, that someone is struggling, we can work to put um, distance between that person and the way that they may thinking, be thinking about changing their, about taking their lives. And one thing we know about access to lethal means is that because people in that state are not able to think flexibly, and they have that tunnel vision, they actually don't think of other methods. So when you, some people say, oh, if you take that method away, they'll use another one, but it doesn't work that way. If you can get them past that crisis time and keep the access to le that lethal method out of their scope, then they won't just seek out another method because they're not thinking as clearly as they normally can. So just this is just a way of showing you that we see one thing, oh, they lost their job or they broke up with their partner. But underneath, we almost always find that these other factors are in the background. And so early identification is really important. And that leads us to prevention. So how do we prevent suicide? There are actually some protective factors. Um, one is to be proactive about your mental health and make an effort to get healthier. That can protect you. And as we said before, it can also make you feel um, physically more healthy as well. In addition, trying to stay connected with your family and your community can help. When somebody is struggling with depression, anxiety, psychosis, or substance use, sometimes these, these protective factors erode or weaken. And then um, we need our friends and family to remind us that no matter how you feel, you may feel like nobody cares about you, but the truth is we really do. And that's really important to stay connected. It also helps to have effective problem solving skills. Um, life can get really tough. But being able to, weigh, to see your way through a problem makes a big difference. And that's something that can be taught as well. And then finally, cultural and religious beliefs that discourage suicide or create a strong sense of purpose can also be a protective factor. Although when somebody's in the throes of, of uh, risk, these things can kind of slip away. But we can help people reconnect with them. And then the most important thing to do when somebody is um, thinking of suicide is, uh, put, is time. Putting time between the person and the lethal method putting, allows the, per, the intensity of that moment to pull back a bit. It helps to allow somebody to intervene and bring somebody to the mental health supports and resources that might be helpful. This is, this is a point that, that uh, I remember you talking about a few minutes ago that when somebody is suicidal, they're very ambivalent about it. A part of them feels hopeless, but then a part of them also does connect with life. And, and if, if I can just help this person get through this really tough period. It might even just be a few minutes or a, or a few hours. Exactly. I can really be making a contribution. That's me. just what I was gonna. I was gonna say exactly what you said, which is that even a few minutes or a few hours 
because for most people, suicide, that suicide crisis is very brief. And if you can help people through that, those minutes or hours, then their, their, the strength of their desire to die decreases, and that leaves room for their strength to want to live. Um, so that's how time is really on our side, and that's how limiting access to lethal means works as well. Um, you know, I've, I've clearly said this already, but mental health care is a very important ingredient in uh, preventing suicide, and that means that when you're worried about somebody, you want to help them seek help from a trained professional. If they had any other health condition, What's the first thing you would say to them? Oh, you have a cold. Did you see your doctor? And so we need to treat mental health the same way that we treat physical health. And um, it's not something you can just tough out, but you actually can benefit from professional assistance. We need a culture where everyone knows how to be smart about mental health. That's a dramatic slide, only two and five, and I've seen statistics like this before. So most people with a mental health condition don't seek out treatment. That's right, and they suffer, and their lives suffer, and their families suffer, and their friends suffer. If you've had somebody that you've been worried about, think about the pain that you feel when you're worried about somebody, and you want to help them. Well, you, you actually can reach out and try to help them. It doesn't mean that you're going to quote, cure them. No, mental health is like physical health. It takes constant awareness and, and taking care of yourself. Um, but you can help someone get to that place. So how do you take care of your mental health? Um, you have to make it a priority. See a doctor or mental health professional. Get an evaluation. Uh, we can't really figure out what's going on just by trying to guess what's going on. There actually are evaluation tools and things we know about mental health. Uh, discuss the treatment options. There are many options available for helping someone who's struggling with a mental health condition. And then it's a conversation because you have to find what works best for you. And like any other health condition, that could change over time. You know, when you have diabetes, you may have an insulin level that's helpful for you at one day, but then you go out and exercise, and then you have another dose, and then you get sick, and that changes your dose. Well, mental health is the same way. If there are things that make help you feel better, then you figure that out and you go towards them. If there are things that make you feel worse, and that's the other part that people don't think about sometimes, if there are things that make you feel worse, stay away from them. You know, find other things that actually make you feel better. If I'm trying to encourage a friend or a family member that I think might be really in serious difficulty uh, and a potential suicide risk, uh, what about suggesting that they just talk to their primary care physician? Is that a well, good idea? You know, talking to your primary care physician is a good start. Uh, they may be able to refer you to someone who has mental health skills, and but they're trained for your primary care, for your general health and well-being. If you had a problem with your joints, they wouldn't necessarily try to solve it themselves. They may send you to a rheumatologist or an orthopedist, to a specialist to get the help for that. Primary care can be really helpful in identifying the problems, but then you need the specialized assistance. And more and more, we're having behavioral health care, which means that mental health providers are within the primary health care system. And we see that as something that has tremendous potential going forward, because people do go to their primary health care um, physicians. So I think that does show uh, you know, promise for the future. Uh, the other thing is that now, recently, the, war, the law now requires insurance plans to cover mental health services the way they cover physical health services, and that is relatively new. If you, you might have had a plan that didn't even have mental health services in the past, and now that's not allowed. And uh, not only is it not allowed, but it has to be covered at the same level. 
All this sounds well and good, but I do want to say that it can be really hard to find a mental health professional. Um, that's why sometimes it helps to have somebody helping you. It can take time to find the person that's right for you, that's available, that you can manage financially. But it's important not to give up and to just know that it's a process. And you're going to push through it to find the person that's right for you. I think there's a really good message here with the change in the regulations that uh, mental health coverage is required as part of health insurance. That what you were saying a few minutes ago that if I had a physical problem, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to go see my doctor. And we want people to start thinking about mental health problems in the same way. If I have a serious mental health problem, I should feel okay and comfortable about seeking the right help. That's right. And we're hoping that as this, these laws have come through, that there'll be better and better mental health care that's more and more accessible. So there's every reason to think this will improve now that it's become a priority. The other thing, and you know, this may sound cliche, but self-care helps mental health. How many people exercise and feel better afterwards? How many people, when they eat healthily, they feel good, and when they eat a bunch of junk food, it's good in the moment, but then they feel terrible. Managing stress and getting good sleep. These are all things, they're basics, and they're really essential to promoting uh, and protecting mental health and promoting resist, uh, resilience. So um, you really have to take care of your whole self. You can't just focus on one body part, in this case, the brain. Um, now, I've said this whoop, repeatedly, so you're probably sick of me saying it, but limiting access to lethal means helps to prevent suicide. This is true during a period of high risk. It doesn't mean that when somebody's risk is reduced, if they should happen to have another crisis, that you've solved it. You do have to think about this from one moment to the next, but it absolutely can make a difference. And so if you think about it, there have been some initiatives that actually have had an impact. So um, reducing carbon monoxide in cars, putting barriers on bridges, blister packaging, more lethal medications, so it takes time, there's that word again, it takes time to get it out, and securing firearms so that the person, um, you know, the problem with the firearm is that it's lethal, and people don't necessarily realize that 50% of all suicides are by firearm, and 63% of all firearm deaths are suicides. And just educating people about safe safety and safe storage and identifying war warning factors can make a big difference. So even having a firearm secured in the sense that it would take some time to, you know, unlock the storage and put the safety, you know, engage the safety or turn off the safety devices that are protecting those firearms, just that that adding that few minutes of time can be really valuable. Absolutely. So that there's not as much access. If I'm talking to a friend or a family member and I think there's a risk for suicide, uh, should I ask them if they have a specific plan to try to find out what means they're considering? Yes, that, that would be really helpful um, to find out, well, if you're thinking about what did you think you were going to do? And if they say, well, I, I just, um, take a bunch of pills, you could say, well, do you have pills at home? Yes. How about if you give them to someone in your house to give you when you need them? Or how about if I take care of them for you until we get you some help and you start feeling better? That conversation is really important. In addition, um, it's important to support people who've lost someone to suicide and those who with lived experience. And more and more people who have experienced mental health conditions or maybe thought about or made a suicide attempt are speaking about those experiences. And um, it's important to allow people to speak, to listen to what they're saying. Not to, they're not always on the verge of suicide if they've had a suicidal experience, but also to support them and help them get to whatever it is that they need. To, uh, so let's talk a little bit about what you can do, okay? Because there are some things that you can do to facilitate somebody getting the help that they need. So first is 
have a conversation. Let, allow them to just share what they're experiencing. If you're the person who's struggling, strike up that conversation with somebody. And if that person isn't comfortable with it, maybe try to find another person who is. They will show you that they care. And if you're talking to someone you're worried about, it shows that you care. And also, you can help them to gain, uh, gain information about what they can do. Watch for the warning signs. Reach out to them and then seek help. And again, if, if they can't seek help on their own, then you, you can certainly help them to seek help. Because remember, when somebody's feeling depressed or anxious, it interferes with their daily life. And they may not be able to do it on their own, but they could do it with some support from a friend. So let's talk about some warning signs. So warning signs can take the form of talk, what people say, behavior, what they do, and mood. So we're going to go through these one by one. So with regard to talk, people who are thinking about suicide actually might mention at some point, relative, not necessarily at the moment at which they want to take their life, but they might start talking about ending their lives. So they might recently have talked about having no reason to live, uh, or that they're just a burden to other people that they feel trapped or that they're in bearable pain. You know, look for these buzzwords because people think that they're a burden to others, but they don't understand. Even if they are a burden to others, that doesn't mean that other people want them dead. So we have to re -help, you know, look for these signs of what people might be talking about. And it just kind of slips out. It's not like they announce it. When you're looking for high-risk behavior, think about increased use of alcohol or drugs. That doesn't mean that they have a substance use disorder, but maybe they're just having a second drink and they usually only have one. Or maybe they're having a couple of drinks when they usually have none. Insomnia, inability to sleep, to fall asleep, to stay asleep. Acting recklessly, uh, going out for long walks at four in the morning when nobody's around. That's actually quite reckless. Skateboarding on high places. Um, also withdrawing from activities that they normally would do. Isolating from family and friends, looking for ways to kill themselves. You might catch them looking on the internet about ways to kill oneself. And also this sort of giving away of possessions. I don't need this anymore. I'd like you to have it. These are behavioral signs that somebody might be at risk. Even if at that moment they don't feel like they want to take their lives, this mental health problem in combination with the wearing away of coping ability can be taking place. In terms of mood, you know, we think about depression. A lot of people don't know that apathy and not caring about things can also be a sign of depression. Also, rage, unexpected rage or irritability, impulsiveness, Another factor, humiliation. When people feel that they'll never recover from something, they've been so humiliated by it. Sometimes this happens as something as simple as failing a test, and sometimes it could be somebody who's been arrested. Anxiety and agitation, you know, that kind of energized, uncomfortable feeling. So trust your gut and assume you're the only one who's going to reach out. You know, if you notice these things in someone, especially if it's more than a day or two, but it's coming on a couple of weeks, assume you're the only one who's going to reach out and talk to the person. And don't hesitate to reach out. Or if you're not the right person, you can always ask somebody else who you feel is and have that conversation. But if your gut tells you this person seems depressed or more anxious, go for it. Have that conversation. And if you're having those thoughts and feelings, then that's a sign that you need to talk to somebody. Reaching out is the step, is the first step. And you know, a person may not be receptive just because you want to reach out to them doesn't mean they want you to reach out to them because they're feeling horrible. They're feeling like nothing's going to help. So it may take reaching out several times. It may take them being kind of not so nice to you, but that could be a sign that they really need that contact. Because talk saves lives, it's a very simple idea. And if you're wrong about the suicide risk, they may still be in distress. And they may just feel comforted because you've reached out and supported them. 
and they know that you care because they may not even feel like anybody cares and um, that you've taken the time to listen is very key and it gives permission to somebody to get help so and, and even even if they're not receptive when I reach out that's on some level that might be getting through that I that I care absolutely because that's one of those it. factors that you mentioned yeah because you said it and maybe in that moment they say no I'm fine I'm fine and maybe there's not the opportunity to follow up so they go home and you go home and they might say wow you know what do they see that I'm not I'm, I don't realize I'm showing or wow that person really cares about me somehow they must you know they must know me well enough to know that I'm not feeling at my best and that connection makes a difference and it added time it might add some really time at a critical moment absolutely where, uh, it delays some destructive action that they were going to take or uh, well uh, my friend is going to call me again in the morning uh, so just that bind for time and get, helping somebody get through that that crisis point. So and now and so how do you reach out, right? First of all, talk to them in private. It's not something you want to shout across the room. You want to give them the time and the the quiet to be able to listen to their story. And you're not going to solve it in that moment, but you can express concern and caring. And you can ask them directly, are you thinking about killing yourself? Have you had those thoughts? And if they say yes, then you can proceed. This is not a comfortable conversation to have, but it could be a life-saving conversation to have. And then you can encourage them to seek mental health services. And your attitude about mental health services is going to affect whether or not they seek mental health services. You know, you want to avoid minimizing their feelings because their feelings are huge and they're their feelings. You don't know exactly what they're feeling. Avoid trying to convince them that life is worth living because in that moment they don't feel that and it may take some time before they feel it. But you can say, I know you feel really crummy now and it's going to take some time for you to feel better and I'm going to be here along the path. So that way you can avoid trying to fix it, uh, which you can't. So what, what I'm hearing is that maybe the first step in reaching out and having this conversation with the person in distress is to acknowledge what they're feeling. Not try to, like you say, not try to fix it, not try to convince them that they're feeling the wrong way, but just starting out by helping them feel uh, that this is a safe conversation and they can actually say what they're feeling and I'm just hearing it and yeah, showing sure. that I care. Being heard is very powerful. You know, wanting to fix it, you know, if you're approaching them, you, I, there's part of you that wants to fix it for them. But um, just being heard and, and acknowledging that you can't fix it, but you can help them to figure out, or you'll be there along their journey, is a really powerful statement. And if you think somebody might make an attempt soon, like in the next very short while, stay with them. Don't leave them alone. Uh, help help them secure or remove lethal means. You don't have to take it away from them, but just say maybe we should put that away, or can you lock that up and give me the key? Um, you know there are many ways to do that, and then take them to get mental health services. You can take them to a local clinic or to an emergency room. Uh, make an appointment with them and go with them to their appointment because they're going to feel ambivalent about it. And if they know you're serious about wanting them to feel better, that's helpful to them. And if it's an emergency or a crisis, you can call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, in fact, you may want to take your phone out right this very second. I'm going to wait a few seconds so people can take their phones out. And we can put this phone number in your phones. And it's 1-800-273-TALK. So that's 1-800-273-TALK. And the other option is the crisis text line, where you text 741-741. And these are services where people on the other end can be helpful in um, discussing what's going on with the person, helping them um, move themselves to a less dangerous situation. 
And again, the same idea of getting time and helping somebody get through that crisis point. Mm -hmm. And if it's an imminent emergency and someone is sitting right in front of you about to make an attempt, you can call 911. And um, more and more the police are being trained on how to work with people with mental health conditions and who are suicidal. And it's making a difference in saving people's lives. You know, that isn't necessarily the first thing you do, but it's always in your back pocket as something that you can do. And so together we can create a culture that's smart about mental health and about suicide prevention. And we'll save lives and vastly improve the lives of so many more. And you can learn more about us at AFSP.org or by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we have lots of information available to you. So um, if there are any questions, and I thank you for listening, and I hope that uh, this has been helpful to you in some way. You might have a local chapter in your area if you have other questions or want to get involved, and you can find that information on our website. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Harkavy. And we just have a very few minutes left, and we've got a number of really great questions that people have sent in. Uh, so here's a question that several people have sent in a similar question to this, where they did lose somebody by suicide, a loved one, and they feel a lot of guilt, and I should have done something to prevent it. Uh, what, what would you say to uh, someone that's had that experience? Well, I think, you know, when somebody loses someone to suicide, there are many feelings that come through and different feelings at different points. It could be guilt, it could be anger, it could be sadness, it could be longing. Um, first of all, uh, it's these are feelings. It doesn't really mean that there's something you could have done. Ultimately, the person takes their life and we do the best that we can and that's part of the problem of hindsight is we may learn afterwards about things that we could have done and that's why you know we're talking about it now so that more people can learn about what to do but um, I think it can be helpful you know check out w um, whether or not there's a suicide loss survivor program in your area which you can find out on our loss and healing section of our website um, also, know you're not alone, and there are many ways to get involved with other people who've lost someone. These feelings, um, nobody can tell you what to feel and how to feel it, and um, living and time and experience, all those things help to manage so that these feelings that are so very huge in the beginning can find a place. You know, you're not going to, it's never going to be okay that you lost this person. It's always going to have some hurt attached to it. Uh, but there is a healing process, and it will find a place in your life with other things that have happened to you, both positive and negative. One of the points that you made in your presentation uh, is that if I uh, know someone that actually did go through with a suicide, uh, looking back, there might be something that happened that I was aware of, but there might have been a half a dozen other factors that I didn't see and that weren't apparent. Absolutely. And that there are a number of factors that are involved uh, with someone who's suicidal. And we don't always get to see everything that's going on. We may, only, we may only see a couple of things. That's right. You, you don't always know what's going on underneath. And sometimes, you know, somebody dies by suicide and everybody is shocked. And they say there were no warning signs. And um, people are, can be very good at keeping these things inside. And that doesn't mean they're not there, but they may not have shared them with you. And you can't help them if they don't share. Uh, so sometimes you really don't know those things are going on inside and in their lives. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I think we have time for one more. Uh, so uh, this is someone who wrote in that uh, she has a loved one who did have a suicide attempt, but the individual is not getting any help. And any suggestions as to what to say or how to try to get 
this person to get some help? You know, this is very challenging. It's, it's like if you know somebody who has a health condition, say diabetes or high blood pressure, and they're, let's say they're not following their diet or they're overweight or they're smoking, you know, and you want to say, please, you, these are things you need to do to take care of yourself and they won't do it. It's very challenging and um, the thing is to try to stick with the person, tell them you care about them, that you don't want to help them self-destruct, but you want to help them feel better, that they can feel better, get some information about whatever they're experiencing, whether it's depression, anxiety, you know, ADA has wonderful information about depression and anxiety. Um, you can contact a mental health professional, and by the way, if you're worried about someone in the moment, you can call the suicide, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, that 1-800-273-TALK number, and they can try to guide you through what to do with that person. But ultimately, it's up to the person, and um, don't forget that there's a person inside there. Maybe do something that might help them to feel better, whether it's exercise or go to the movies or just engage with them and you know just try to encourage them to take care of themselves but ultimately you know it's up to them I think we have time for one more question uh, boy this is a tough one uh, my relationship isn't working but my partner says if I break up she's gonna commit suicide what should I do how should I handle it well that's that's a really tough situation that does happen and you know you have to do two things in that situation you do the best with the person you care about but you can't be take, not take care of yourself so you have to take care of yourself if you need to leave that relationship you need to leave that relationship you can try in the process to help that person get some help if they won't go with you you know you can offer to go together you can start even with couples counseling and then bow out or bring them and say I care about you I don't want any I don't want you to hurt yourself or to kill yourself you're important I just it's just I can't be in this relationship but I would like to help you here's a place that you can go do you want me to make an appointment do you want me to go with you um, if they're imminent in that moment, then you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-TALK, and try to, you might even be able to put them on the telephone and get them to help them. But you also have to take care of yourself. If it's a long process, you might meet with a mental health professional to help guide you through that process but you have to take care of yourself as well as the other person and it's not you're not helping another person by staying in a relationship that's not a genuine relationship and so um, ultimately you can give them resources and and try to get them to get help and that's the best you can do yeah great answer really great ideas well thanks again uh, just fabulous presentation and I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, and bye for now, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much.